Welcome back to another podcast episode where we help aspiring developers get jobs and junior developers grow. So with this podcast episode, we're going to be reviewing Coding Dojo. We did a review a while back. It's been a while, so I want to do a recent review. I invited on three graduates to give their real stories. And if you watch my episodes before, you know I like to get past the marketing BS of what Coding Bootcamp spit out. I like to dig into the real experiences. So that's what we're going to do. So like usual, we'll go ahead and start with our intros. Uh, a few questions for you, Jacob. Um, where are you at, or when did you graduate? Where are you at in the job search? And what industry did you come from? Uh, so I graduated in November. Um, where am I at in the job search? I just started looking for a job again. Um, I just, I had a developer job and then it ended. And then now I'm looking for a job again. And um Hey, what was the other question? Excuse me, sorry. Old oh, industry. What was my old industry? So I was right before um, stuff happened in 2020, I was a uh, Lyft driver. And then before that, I was an insurance agent. So, Okay, cool. Sounds good. How about you, Julian? Yeah, so uh, graduated in uh, May of 2021. Uh, after that, uh, I did a little bit of job hunting, but really couldn't find anything. So I joined a, a different boot camp, a Code Up boot camp. Uh, just graduated from Code Up on April first, and so now I'm currently on the job market, looking for anywhere to fit in and uh, you know continue my growth. Uh, the industry I came from, I'm a, uh, I was a uh, corporate recruiter, a high volume recruiter, so doing a lot of. Uh, interaction with people, not a lot of uh, technical experience there. So it was very humbling uh, getting into the uh, developing industry, if you will. Yeah, makes sense. Um, all right, cool. You'll be able to later in the episode share some of that comparison, I guess, between the two coding boot camps. All right. How about you, Adrian? Uh, I graduated last December, December 2021. And um, I've been, uh, right now I work at UPS and as far as like my job search goes for web development, it's been pretty good. I still say I'm like really in my job hunt stage. I landed an internship for this, um, this marketing company and it's a part-time position. So it's UPS. And so I'm just looking, I'm still looking for that role to like fully transition and go from there. Okay. All right, cool. That sounds good. All right, well, I usually go over that because people like to just hear backgrounds and stuff like that and see how things are going. But let's go ahead and jump into things. So um, I guess we'll start with this. Why did you choose Coding Dojo over all other coding boot camps? Um, and anyone can talk. Uh, I'll start. Uh, for the most part, like they offer more stacks and it, it's honestly personal preference because like, Say you're like in a in a buffet. I'm the, I'm the type to like want variety on my plate. So when I saw there's three stacks, I knew I wasn't going to enjoy one stack right away. So coming out of it, I would have a good idea of what these languages are about, which one I'd like, and take it from there. And that's actually what happened. So yeah, that's what it is for me. Okay, cool. Yeah, I have to agree with Adrian on that. Um, it was the variety, uh, being able to do uh, Python, Mern, and then Java, uh, and being able to identify uh, what I can do with each one uh, was the selling point for me. Uh, I'm I'm a veteran, so I used my uh, BRNE benefits to to pay for my way to go through there. So that was the other reason. Uh, their vet pro their their veteran department uh, was the one that reached out to me and was like, hey, we can get you in as a developer, you can use these benefits. And so that what, that's what sold me as well. Okay. Uh, for me, it was, I mean, yes, the three stacks were nice. Uh, another thing is they had advertised a pretty high placement rate. Uh, their recruiter was really nice. Uh, their marketing campaign on YouTube was very aggressive. And what I mean by that is every single time I got on YouTube, uh, it was a coding dojo ad for like three months, including after I finished the program. So in fact, even just me talking about it right now, I'm probably gonna get some more ads about it. So uh, it was the first one I saw advertised and I started looking into coding boot camps 
because I got it advertised for me, uh, looked into a bunch and then had settled on that one. Uh, we did, I did online, but they did have like a semi-local campus to me. Um, I didn't attend it cause it was during the event, but, uh, <laughs> so everybody was remote for everything, but, um, yeah, I mean, that was the big one for me. Okay. Oh, and then they offered career services permanently afterwards. Uh, which was a big selling point for me. Uh, combine that with the decently high placement and the fact that they one of their sales plans was that you could uh, have them take a percentage of what you your wages um, after, like pay after once you have a job or whatever. Um, it showed confidence. I didn't use that, but like it showed confidence to me that they were confident in high placement. Okay, so that was the ISA that they offered. Yes. Yeah. I couldn't okay. Pay, so thank you. Well, I'm sorry to say, you're probably stuck with those ads. They're not going away at this point. Oh, yeah, it's, oh, yeah for sure. <laughs> um, all right, so I guess I'm, I'm going to jump into it, and we can talk more about the program. The, so their full-time program is 14 weeks, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That doesn't seem like a lot of time for three stacks. No. Uh, honestly, and, it could have been longer. Like, I would have been completely okay with another month. To be honest, probably needed. But Honestly, yeah, it was it was way. Uh, again, being able to compare the two, coding dojo and Coda, you know, I I saw that doing it that way, doing the coding dojo way, where you sped through everything for fourteen weeks and got you know, so two weeks was web development, um, the front end, all the front end stuff. Then four weeks Python, four weeks. Uh, Mern four weeks Java. It was just so much crammed in, and it almost seemed like they were just trying to push numbers out and try to get people to pass instead of really diving in and learning what you were doing. I, I got lost so many times, to be honest with you. So yes, to to go off your your feedback, yeah, fourteen weeks was a very short amount of time to get everything done. Okay, I feel like so. There's nothing wrong with the learning multiple stacks. And, you know, Adrian, like you said, it was a bit of a preference. You liked, you got bored easily, essentially. You wanted to learn a bunch of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, one of my initial uh, directors, well, boss of my boss for my first developer position, like he just, he experimented. He built anything. He built Xbox scripts when he was starting out. And like he built a, a, a coaster, it was a mobile app where you just literally put your beer on it. It was the dumbest app, but he just wanted to build it. Like, is anyone going to download it, right? So he just, he experimented with a bunch of stuff. And so, you know, there are going to be personalities that love that sort of thing. And I, I think, you know, throughout your development career, you should be open to exploring different languages and different stacks if they come up. You don't have to, you can specialize, right? But if you are open to it, you can learn different conventions and, um, you know, just learn different ways of, um, yeah, essentially different conventions and how to do things and organize things just a little bit differently based on the framework. So, but when you do cram that into 14 weeks, there's not a lot of depth. I have a feeling a lot of graduates are coming out of it and now they're starting to like really dive deeper. Now they're really having to reinforce a lot of what they're learning. And maybe this isn't true for every single graduate, but after reviewing a lot of programs, 14 weeks generally, like usually people complain when they have to learn two stacks in three months. I mean, some people complain one stack in, in three months, depending on how well they, how well they do it. So, um, I mean, that's, I, so would it be unfair to say that there's probably not a lot of depth in your learning when you're split between those three stacks and you might have to reinforce a lot of that and go deeper after you graduate? Uh, so there's definitely the expectation you're going to get deeper. I have found based off my conversations with other people in my program, as well as like other cohorts is what they're called. Um, it really depends on who you got as an instructor. Um, mm -hmm. if you got an instructor that you could ask questions and knew the, knew everything really deep, it was really well done. But, uh, there were some instructors, uh, but one of the other cohorts that, uh, I spoke with had a Python instructor that, uh, like wasn't any good and kind of disappeared after a few weeks. So they, uh, it's just, uh, it, it can be kind of hit or miss. I got lucky, I think, because all the instructors I ran into had a very good understanding of, of all the stacks, but um, I have heard that it can be kind of hit or miss. Okay. Yeah, and they do provide like, like some optional after like the exam, like there's some more like in-depth concepts you go over on your own. 
and I guess ask like the instructor, but like they're they're optional like after the exam, so you don't really have to dive into it too. I mean, I like that they included it though. Do you feel like you have the time to do that, or does it really concern? Okay. <laughs> That's the thing is that they provided it, but there was no time to actually do it. You you were responsible for your daily assignments. Um, <clears throat> you were responsible for your daily assignments and then trying to keep up with everybody as far as like the exams go, trying to make that red belt or black belt, whatever the case may be. And so, uh, so yeah, at the time, to me, I felt wasn't there because I was stuck trying to stay stay afloat. I had a very different experience um, than it sounds like you guys did or even the other people in my cohort. Um, I did uh, Harvard's CS50 Intro to Computer Science right before I did the, the boot camp. Um, so I had already had kind of like the basics down. Um, I also love learning. So I'm just prefacing with, and I, and I don't have, I didn't have anything going on. I wasn't working. I was just, I poured my savings into it and just had uh, three months to get through the program and basically get a job with me. Right. Like I was like, I gotta do that to survive. Um, I also don't mind going without sleep. Right. So I actually ran into the other problem where for me, there wasn't enough content. Um, I would pour through all the content uh, within like one to two weeks and have the entire month's work done, already take the tests, have a perfect marks on it, and then be hanging out just waiting for more content. That was actually one of the, uh, one of the only complaints that I had against them is that uh, the recruiter told me it was self-paced. Um, and I understand where they're saying that because they're like, hey, you have a month and here's all the stuff you need to get done, like have it done by the end of the month uh, to take the test. But if you finish too quickly, um, it's not self-paced. You're just stuck there, not doing anything for like two weeks at a time um, because they won't push you onto the next cohort. Uh, they won't push you onto the next cohort because they're big on keeping the cohorts together. But then if you fall behind, they allow you to continuously retake it and rejoin other cohorts. So they're not actually that much about Core. They just have a policy where they won't let you complete it faster, um, which was very frustrating to me. But yeah, I so like I did the Mern stack. I got that all done in one week. Um, it was a four week program. I shot through it in one week. Yeah, uh, it was. And then I just sat around and tutored the other students because I had the extra time um, for the you know uh, the other stacks. I did also see that there were people who joined, and I don't know if you guys had this experience. People who joined the Web Fundamentals group, which was the first two weeks, uh, and the dropout rate in those first two weeks was pretty high because there were people who were in there who, in our cohort, like in my Web Fund cohort, which was just again just the first two weeks, I had people who didn't even know how to right click uh, on their computer and had for some reason decided to sign up for a coding bootcamp, um, and they did not make it through the first two weeks. Um, but they don't really offer refunds after the first even like week. So um, that was another thing that was a, a little interesting. It's not for everybody. If you, if you don't know how to right click, don't go to a coding bootcamp, folks. Um, I want to unpack a couple of things unless you have a lot more. No, I mean, that was, uh, that was about everything. Uh, the only other thing that I'd say was because I went so fast, I didn't really do the lectures. I did everything kind of self-taught and their online uh, learning system um, can vary based on what, uh, what section you're in. So if you're in Java, uh, the Java section was being restructured as I was in it. And so because of that, there was a lot of stuff that was just like code examples that were just wrong and weren't working. Uh, and when I'd ask them about that, they'd go, well, it rely like it's a net and it has holes in it and relies on the lectures to fill in those holes. Um, but then it was also supposed to be self-paced. So I kind of called them out uh, for that as well. So overall, I would have rated it like a four out of five, like an eight out of 10. There were definitely some small holes. Uh, the Java, I still have access to it and it's already been massively improved. But at the time that I was going through it, uh, it wasn't great. Um, and so because of that, it took me longer to just get through the basic stuff. Right. But, uh, let's, let's pause there. We'll have like tons of time to kind of explore in more depth with this, but I want to unpack a couple things. So, you know, it sounds like you prepare. So I, I'm just going to ask like on average, how much sleep did you get per night? So, uh, <laughs> I got plenty of sleep because I get through the content really fast and then I would sleep fine. So like Mern, for instance, I would, so I start the cohort on Monday or we actually would start to get access to the cohort on Friday. So, or the, not the cohort, the new um, stack. We'd get access to the stack on Friday, but we wouldn't at the end of the day. Uh, so we could work on it over the weekend to get ahead. And then we would start the class on Monday. Um, so I would try and get, like I would on Friday, 
at about 4 p.m. we would get access and I would just stay up and work all through the night. So I wouldn't sleep. I'd pull an all nighter. And then I'd go to sleep the next night at like probably 10 p.m. And then sleep for eight hours, wake up and then just uh, do the entire rest of the content, just busting it out. And then um, I would have the first about week, week and a half done. Uh, and then I would sleep for a couple of days, uh, you know, do normal eight hour sleep nights while working during the day. Um, but even during those days, it was, I'd wake up and I'd code and I'd be coding until I went to sleep because I, I don't know, I didn't have anything else going on. I kind of just dedicated myself to it completely, uh, when I got into it. So, okay. I um, would argue you're an exception, not the rule. Yeah, <laughs> and you, you've stayed there. That. Yeah. Right. I, um, so my recommendation with this, um, it's just advice. Don't, don't code all the way throughout the night. A lot of people... I mean, it's going to be when you're going through an intense full time coding boot camp, even part time, if you're trying to do it, work on the side, like you got to give yourself time to really let a lot of these concepts solidify. Um, so I would I think I have a question about so you, you mentioned people are coming into the coding boot camp that didn't even know how to right click. So I'm going to be honest, I'm a little concerned with that. And I feel like the app, so I guess my question is, what kind of technical screening or any sort of screening did they do to make sure that you were actually prepared for the program? Honestly, I don't remember any technical. Yeah, they just asked me over the phone if I had any experience. Yeah. They just wanted to know if you wanted to go, pretty much. Yep. So that was pretty much it. Very okay. little, very little oversight. Uh, they do say that you can kind of take it as many times as you need to to get through it. Um, at least that was a big thing that was pushed. Like, hey, if you fail all the tests and fall really by behind, you can retake the stacks until you pass them. But uh, yeah, there was no like. And they they had like a an assessment, but like I'm pretty sure it just led everyone to it. Just I'm pretty sure it said do the prerequisites or something like that, which is just web fun. So HTML, and CSS, I think it was. They did offer a pre boot camp thing that you could that you could do. Um, I did the actual like online program. I didn't actually, evidently there were actual like a class thing that you could attend that would extend it. So it was longer than 14 weeks. I only know that because one of the other cohorts that I talked to, uh, some of the people from there, because the cohorts mix at the end of every stack, they switch up. So I'd occasionally run into whenever the stacks would end and we'd be switched up. I would talk to other people with other stacks, but um, a couple of them actually got like an extra three or four weeks where they did like a pre boot camp boot camp thing. Um, Got yeah, it. I found it later too. So, same. Okay. Well, do you have? So I hear that it's mainly self-paced. Do you have a lot of group work in the program? No. There no. Was, yeah, unless, yeah, unless unless it was unless you and, and a teammate decided to work together, uh, that was the only time. But like, it wasn't. It wasn't something that they. It wasn't a requirement that they had. Like going through code up, we had a bunch of pair programming assignments. And that was really I enjoyed that very much and wished Coding Dojo had offered that as well or enforced it a little more to make teams work together and get that that I mean, insight. Like, the algorithms every morning you get put in a breakout room and it's like that is true. Yeah. so ideally you're supposed to all collaborate, but like in my experience, it, it didn't always work like that. Sometimes it was everyone with the cameras off and like working by themselves. So yeah, probably yeah. I, I, in sometimes you'll hear about those issues in other programs, but it's the, essentially the coding boot camps job to try to reinforce it if you really want to ensure like that is a, a staple to the value that you offer with the coding boot camp. So it sounds like they really didn't hold people accountable for that as much and you can get away with it that's a choice they made that's fine i can see so you know when you don't get screened out you can come in with a variety of skill levels right your whole cohort can be at a different level and if you're doing group work is it possible that someone is just going to be completely oblivious to what's going on and just they need more time to ramp up to be able to work with you through that problem uh, yes and no. It kind of depends on the stack. And sorry to just be quick on the draw there with the, the response, but um, You're fine. the the web fund is the first two weeks. You have to make it through that. And then you have Python for the first stack. Everybody starts with Python. Um, if you don't, and you keep the same cohort from web fund to Python, if you don't pass Python, 
you can't go onto the other stacks. Um, and if you like, they just won't let you into the other stacks. So everybody into, in my case, I did Java and Mern. It sounds like you did that ju too, Julian. Um, for Java and Mern, I at least knew that the people knew enough to get through Python and pass it. So they weren't like, they didn't have no idea what was happening. But uh, yeah, in WebFund, I worked with people who, I mean, I saw a lot of people just fail out of WebFund and it was just basic HTML, CSS. Um, it barely introduced JavaScript at the end. And, and there were people that were not able to pass that. And so, because um, again, there were a couple of people who didn't actually even know how to right click when they started. I'm not, that wasn't a joke. I didn't believe that there were people who didn't know how to right click. And then we were on a live Zoom call and they were asking, right? Like, I believe you. I, I do. I mean, that's what happens when you have no screening like that whatsoever. Um, but they do it. So it sounds like they do let you roll back. Um, do they charge extra if you roll back? Uh, I'm sorry, Adrian. Uh, I'm pretty sure they do. I forgot what the fee was, though. Yeah, I thought it was after you roll back more than so many times you get charged, but... Um, didn't yeah, I think, yeah, I think after one rollback you get one and then after that you have to pay uh, yeah but not but too sure like how much what the cost tries. was you have three tries on the exam yes yeah okay okay um okay i don't know how i feel about that so they're not charging initially so i thought they were trying to be lenient with this offering like that's their model they just do you, you need to roll back two or three times that's fine that's why we didn't screen you right but now i get this feeling that like this feels a little bit more profit driven like everyone just sign up so we can get as much money as possible and we're going to have a model to try to prevent you from moving on to the next section but then if they're going to be charging people like you like you can get rolled if you're not prepared at all like you can get rolled back a couple of times right and if they don't properly screen that that's a big deal that's a big problem and now they're going to charge you extra because they failed at their job to screen you and make sure that you're actually prepared for the program like this pre-work i hear that there's pre-work that's required um but it sounds like they're not even holding people accountable for like truly understanding that pre-work and HTML and CSS. That's not going to prepare you for programming. Like it'll give you a little exposure to, to get some front end website up, but like that's not going to give um, instructors like a, um, I guess like an aptitude uh, mark, like where you currently are with how you're going to do for the rest of the uh, program, especially with the logic portion of it. I, this feels like a whole, and the, I, I hear that there might be other good parts of the program, but this feels like like my strong advice, and you guys correct me if you completely disagree, my strong advice is to definitely take a few months of your own time, really get the fundamentals down before you dive in. Like get comfortable with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, or like whatever, I, I mean, I don't think you should learn all three languages before you go into the program, but using one programming language in general to learn fundamentals of programming it sounds like all students should seriously consider doing that before they just sign up because you can't trust the coding boot camp to prevent you from signing up until you're ready. Yeah, uh, I I met one to talk about the rollbacks just for another second. I met one guy who had uh, it was his third time trying uh, Python. And um, to my knowledge, he hadn't been charged anything extra. So I have no idea how many rollbacks you get. But um, for him okay. specifically, it was his third time. And, um, that's a question asked then admissions you know how many times can i roll yeah. back without getting charged yeah okay um all right let's dive a little bit deeper into it um in jacob you kind of elaborated quite a bit and feel free to respond as well but julian and adrian especially like how were your experiences with the program uh mostly positive mostly uh like the instructors at least i really liked all of my instructors but um I, um, I'll be honest, I was a little scared when I saw my Python instructor because he was really young and I was like a couple of years older than me. So I could only imagine what it's like for like an older, older developer. So, and it, it didn't help that he was also in his like job hunt and he got an offer like midway through the stack and he had to go and then the TA had to take over. But um, I think I'd say I got the best experience from the um, an instructor with the most experience in the industry for sure like just makes sense and okay yeah pretty much yeah 
yeah, I mean, had I had done this interview last year, I would have definitely given it a four, four and a half, you know, the coding dojo. Doing it now, I give it three and a half. Uh, going through coding dojo and being code up, I honestly give it a three, three and a half. Uh, it helped me understand what I was getting myself into. It humbled me very much. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I feel like like your last comment had made that you had made uh, here recently is that uh, it was more about the money and them getting people pushed through and almost uh, it felt uh, it felt almost as if they were teaching you how to pass the exam and not teaching you what you're doing. And so to understand and truly get an understanding of what you're doing, you had to do your own research and I understand it's a self-paced kind of program, but uh, to spend $14,000 on a program and not have that help and then have TAs essentially come out and help you and say, oh, well, we're going to have to find another TA. And then you just get bounced around between TAs. There's no instructor to really, for me at least, there was no instructor to really help out. There was one instructor and he was my instructor the whole way through. I was... I was one of the fortunate ones to have the same instructor for uh, for Python, Learn, and uh, wow. and Java. And so, uh, uh, being able to have him, he was definitely influential on me being able to get through the whole program. Uh, without him being my instructor, I really don't think it would have been, been possible. But I've heard horror stories from other uh, classmates and, and their experience with other instructors as well. So, you know. If I, it, again, given in a rating and after going through code up, there's a lot to be left. There's a lot to, uh, to be desired. There you go. A lot to be desired with coding dojo uh, that, that I just wish I would have known back then. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, it sounds like you can get a really good instructor or a really bad one. Um, it, yes. it sounds like it's polarized like that. And, you know, I'm sure they're putting in the effort to like, it's hard to retain instructors sometimes and TAs. And I understand stuff like that does come up. Um, but it's, I mean, it, it's something like that will completely change your experience. If you have a bad instructor that all, that $14,000 price mark reduces down to like 4,000, right? It's no longer worth anywhere close to that. So, you know, for the people that do have that bad experience with an instructor, you know, that's a big deal. And hope, I'm sure, do they, they probably like collect feedback of like how their instructors are doing. Okay. So that's important. Um, and hopefully they're taking that feedback um, seriously. I got a comment. Um, you couldn't make it to the, review but he mentioned there's a major skill gap between the instructor and the tas like a very major skill back yeah. and so go ahead oh i'm sorry so it, most of the tas are fresh the, the tas are fresh students like they just graduated and then they have applied to be a ta while they continue to look for a job um they just get paid an hourly amount and they they clock on help out as many students as they can but the tas are also lopsided there are more tas available for certain stacks than there are for others like for example java has almost no tas because uh, almost nobody wants a ta for java uh because it's just a little harder uh one of my yellow flags before going into the program was also a lot of the instructors are also students um they'll be a ta for x number of time and then they'll become instructors um, once they can demonstrate that they know more about the programs and, and stuff. So, and that's how we can kind of get instructors that are also still looking for jobs, right? Um, so that was that was something that I noticed. Uh, you mentioned the surveys, if they check feedback, uh, they take, they, it becomes a joke how many surveys we get. Uh, you get surveys, uh, you get daily surveys, you get weekly surveys, and then you get uh, stack like quarterly surveys, right? So once a, once a stack, you get a survey. Uh, every day when you log on, um, there is more than likely a survey waiting for you to fill out before to let you do anything. And then as you finish the stack, you got to fill out that survey. Um, and then they'll stack surveys, right? So you'll fill out the daily survey and then it'll be time for the weekly survey. So as soon as you fill that out, it'll give you a weekly survey. And then, oh, you just finished your stack. You filled that out. Now the stack survey pops up, right? Uh, it can be funny sometimes how many surveys there are. Um, and they, they, they make jokes about it. On top of that, you can also leave comments anywhere on their programs. Uh, you can highlight and then right click and leave a comment to say, hey, like there's a spelling error here, there's a code problem here, different things like that. So you can give feedback on a more specific case by case too. 
Um, okay. I don't know if it's booked, but you did ask how much they take as feedback, and there are lots of avenues. I did find that my experience with other people, you definitely have to speak up to get people to give you help. Um, if you're just quiet, uh, they'll just assume that you're working away and not doing anything. Um, I'm loud in demand to be helped if I need it, so <laughs> I was able to get help. But that's good feedback, I, and a lot of students are quiet. A lot of students are quiet. So, I mean, even like in person where everyone's in front of an instructor, like you'll still have a good chunk of the class that won't ask that question. Like they're afraid of being embarrassed or, you know, they're just kind of waiting. Maybe it'll be answered. You know, there are a lot of different reasons why people don't speak up. But yeah, that's that's really good feedback. Um, how big were so I guess one thing, one last question with the instructors, how big were your cohorts? And did you just have one instructor for your cohort? Um, yes, we had for for me for Java. <clears throat> when I went through Java, they had like <laughs> like four instructors because not one really understood what they were doing, and and so uh, the instructor I I, I speak highly about uh, Sarab, he uh, he actually didn't know Java and he ended up leading the class and in instructing the class. Uh, as far as the other stacks go, I only had one instructor um, and along with the TAs, the, the assigned TAs to that class. There was only one instructor that led the class. Okay. So my experience, it was about 30 people at the beginning of each cohort. Uh, we had one instructor and then one to two TAs, depending on the uh, the stack. Um, I got a, I had a different teacher for like, Web fund and Python, same teacher. Every other stack was a different teacher um, and a different cohort. And so we would be mixed. Uh, I did notice kind of what Julian was saying, and I'm very sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, Julian. Um, okay, perfect. Um, the teachers kind of seemed like they're shuffled around too. So some of them are like, no, I'm clearly a Python teacher. And then they'll be shuffled into uh, teaching Java when they need more Java instructors. And so that's how you can kind of get those situations. Okay. Oh yeah, mine was like Jacob's, just one instructor, and just like one, I will max two TAs. I was only for one class. So. How big was your cohort? Uh, I think it averaged like around twenty people on each one. Okay. I think the lowest amount was thirteen or fifteen. I'm not too sure, but yeah. And that's why yeah. I said twenty at the beginning of the cohort because there was always going to be people who like dropped. Mm hmm. Yeah, it ranged for me like 25 to 35 between each stack. That's a, um, that's a big ratio. It's actually a pretty big ratio. I can see some, like if the cohort is your size, especially Julian, it's going to be a little bit harder to get that instructor's intention. Even with two TAs, that's still, it's not a favorable ratio. Um, and it, it, you're going to complicate it by like having a tons of people in that cohort potentially that aren't even prepared for, especially with that first section that aren't even prepared for it as well. Um, that's going to make the instructors and TAs jobs much, much harder. Um, placement rates. So it looks like they advertise 80 or yeah, 89.1%. So kudos to them because a, a lot of coding boot camps will say, yeah, you know, 90% and they won't really include the year. And it's from like 2019 before everything happened, right? It's like, okay, they're at least saying, okay, 89.1 in 2019, right? Because, you know, like 90% and up, it's, it's pretty much BS through 2020 and 2021 for almost every single program. And I, I've done a bunch of episodes, you can watch them or listen to them talking about like exactly how they are able to get away with displaying these numbers. Um, one question I would ask admissions specifically before you even go in, let's see if they have an, any integrity and honesty, is what actually excludes student data from that criteria, right? So a lot of times coding boot camps will exclude that criteria if you roll back. If you roll back, you are not kind of that typical student that will graduate on time. And that's usually the phrase that you're going to look for in different reports. And so that 89.1%, do they include students that do get rolled back? Ask that question. It's really important. Um, and just ask, like, what other criteria would exclude student data from this, right? What happens, like... And again, it's like students that like weren't prepared and eventually have to, like, drop out even if they get that refund because, like... 
you know, the, sometimes the program isn't going to be designed for that student. That's the whole point of admissions to make sure it's a good fit. And so a lot of times that data gets dropped as well. And so it just it continues to bump up that placement number. So, you know, I'm not going to dig into their reports or statistics, but those are really good questions to ask admissions. And I'm telling you, it's like, if it's not 89.1 and they start like the admissions is actually a little bit more honest about it like we do exclude these rollbacks etc you know that's that's not necessarily a terrible thing if admissions is just completely lying about it and like there's no they can't back up their data whatsoever with any of that criteria that should be a red flag i i think like you know usually a co that's the thing a lot of coding i'm not going to get into it but a lot of coding boot camps are just trying to push that placement number up because that's all people care about but now like a lot of programs are dishonest about it so I'm also curious to know, like, if the TAs are in that numbering factor. Most likely. You know? They usually yeah, are. So, yeah. But they, I mean, you know, that's how I felt. I felt like if you couldn't get, if they couldn't find you a job outside of Coding Dojo, they would just hire you on as TA so their numbers could stay. That's how I felt. I don't know. That's very possible. A lot of coding boot camps do that. And a lot of people don't realize that's what bumps up the number. Go ahead, Jacob. Uh, just a quick thing to add. So they were, because um, I did ask them a bunch of questions and looked into the the hiring number quite a bit. I looked at the actual, like, I have a PDF of the study that they published for it. Uh, it's published by a third party. Uh, and it's people who got a job within six months of graduating. So I think it only looked at graduates. Um, I don't know any details beyond that. Well, I can't remember them. Um, but yeah, so it's definitely worth looking into more. Uh I was going to say, though, for the TA, in order to be a TA, you had to get perfect marks on all the tests um, throughout the course. Um, they were pretty strict on that. And then in order to be a, uh, to go from a TA to a teacher, you had to be a TA for X number of time. Um, right. So it wasn't just anyone could be a TA. It was only the people who already got the grading system. They have um, a yellow belt and a black belt where you fail the test. So if you get uh, if you do the standard requirements, it's yellow belt. If you go above and beyond, you get what's called a black belt. And you had to get a black belt on all three of the uh, the stacks to get um, the ATA. I was just trying to jump in there, Julian. I thought, well, that was my experience, and that's what I was told by all the instructors. But, uh, you know, maybe they changed that or something. But, yeah. Well, that's important information to know. Um, some coding boot camps will just launch um, their TAs right into instructor positions um, just because they're desperate for an instructor, right? They have those hard requirements. Good for them. Um, let's jump into career services. Sounds like, you know, that was a big selling point and some coding boot camps will drop it after like six months and which I think is pretty ridiculous. It doesn't sound like coding dojo does that, but yeah. How, how were your experiences with that? I, uh, I'm sorry to, to compare the two between code up and coding dojo, but going between the two career services, uh, coding dojo. They, uh, they say they offered like uh, help building, uh, uh, creating your resume, cover letter and all that things, but there was never really any workshops. And if there were workshops, uh, it was very few, few and far between. So like you had one, one month and then maybe six months down the road, you might have another one. And if you couldn't make that one month, you were expecting them to send you the recording of it. And then career services is not sending you recordings, they're not sending you any of the decks to to like, you know, teach yourself on how to create a, a good resume, and how to sell yourself basically. So uh, it lacked the career, uh, it, at least for me, I, my, my, uh, my personal career service representative, if you will, he, he was, he lacked very much uh, compared to Coda. I mean, Coda is on it and it's like, you know, every so often they're reaching out to me and they're like, hey, what's, what's going on with your job search? And they require you to do five job applications per week, you know, in order because CODEP has a money back guarantee as well. So if they don't, if you don't get a job within six months of graduating, they'll give you your money back 100%. So, but there's certain things you have to do as well. So they're staying on top of it. Where Coding Dojo, they're just very relaxed. Okay. Yeah, like I, I, I kind of fell off my career services manager. Like at, at the start, it's just that I didn't feel prepared to like start applying because like I wanted to finish my my personal projects. So I told him I, I needed some time. Then once he thought I was ready, he he suggested that I that I apply to a hundred a hundred jobs or something like that. 
I'm not even sure if he was serious about that. That's just like way too many. And I, don't, I just thought it was just too rushed. He did help me with my resume. And it was, and he was like really professional. It seemed like he didn't know what he was talking about. But I, I just felt like I didn't really need it so much. So Okay. So <laughs> um, I got help with career services even while I was still in the program because as I talked about, I had a lot of spare time. And then it's also, um, I talked earlier about how sometimes you like, you just have to speak up and demand help. Um, I, the way I saw it, I paid for it. And so if I messaged one of them and wasn't able to get help, I would just go systematically through messaging every single one of them until I got a response. Um, we all have a discord server that were added to from the beginning. Um, once I got my one career services guy, I was pretty well set. Um, he did everything from help me daily on my resume uh, setting up my LinkedIn. And then, um, I got a job within three weeks of leading, uh, leaving the coding dojo. And I worked that for the last three months. Um, and then I'm only just now searching for a job again. So, I mean, but I was not, I, as we talked about more of the exception, right. I was doing 50 plus, uh, job applications a day, plus running my, uh, resume plus, um, doing my LinkedIn. And I got to, I keep a spreadsheet of all the different things. I got to 269 job applications before I got a job offer. Uh, and then, but I wanted a job offer within the next couple of weeks. I've gotten more people that have reached out since then because I applied for so many jobs over such a short period of time that to this day, I continue to get like rejection emails from people that I applied to four or five, uh, six months ago. And I think that's hilarious that some companies take that long to, uh, to look for people, but that's the case. Uh, and then I get emails from career services once uh, about once every few days to once a week with new with jobs that are hiring right now um, and with any programs that Coding Dojo does in connection with other companies. Um, we also... Get on once a month. You get on once a month? Yeah. Well, because I was running into, they've been changing it up. So I got, um, they used to have a spreadsheet and they just discontinued it where they would just post updates on what jobs were hiring and what jobs weren't hiring. It was called the Career Corner. Uh, and then they just discontinued that and they've switched to doing an email system. Um, I've gotten a lot of emails recently because they sent out an email and messed up some of the links and then corrected the email and then sent it out. And then uh, they still had messed up links. So they sent out a third one. So I got three really rapidly. Uh, and then it was a few days after that, I got a, another one, which just two more. Um, and then I just applied to those. Um, and then different career services guys take entirely different approaches to how you do it. Some people are like, some of the career services managers are very big on just like apply as much as possible. Uh, mine was actually like, Hey, get a LinkedIn, start going to networking events, uh, shoot for like 20 to 30 a week. And, you know, just kind of keep hitting it, keep working on your stuff, try to network so that you can try and get referrals uh, because referrals have a much higher, higher rate. Um, they have closer to like, I think he said like a 40% um, higher rate versus uh, you have like a 4% if it's just a base application you're sending in. Um, I took a different approach than what he recommended because I heard 4% and went, oh, okay. So I only have to turn in like three or 400 applications to guarantee a job. Uh, and then just did whatever I could to get to that number as fast as possible. Um, and I mean, that worked. So, um, that's, uh, that was my experience with career services and with the, uh, the initial job hunt. Okay. 40%. That's interesting. I should I should do a podcast episode and just I brought on a few hiring managers a long time ago. I wonder if they'd be willing to share stats like that. I don't know. Let me think about it. Uh, how prepared did you feel for getting hired for a professional developer position after you graduated Coding Dojo? Immediately after, not prepared at all because I, I was honestly I was kind of scared because like my portfolio is lacking, like. Part of the reason why I went to Coding Dojo is because I thought I would already have like a pretty nice portfolio, but like you don't really need to do like the personal projects, like what they were claiming was going to be your portfolio. So like my, my portfolio was like non-existent when I got out and so I had to take some time, but okay. just, honestly, just go, just go for, go for a chance. I was scared, but like. I, I got a job that was like asking for like minimal requirements and it just so happened that I was able to get the job. So it was cool. 
All right. How about you? I don't feel I was prepared. Uh, you know, uh, once I graduated, a buddy of mine uh, that graduated with me, uh, he got a job fairly quickly and uh, he explained, uh, you know, he explained the, the importance of GitHub and pushing things to Git. And Coding Dojo really didn't uh, emphasize that as much. And it, they showed you one day, this is GitHub, this is how you use it. And that was it, you know. Um, and so when my buddy was like, yeah, you need to be pushing to GitHub every day. You need to be uh, collaborating with other people and doing pull requests. Just stay familiar with GitHub because a lot of companies use it. And, uh, you know, so that was just proving my point that I wasn't ready for the workforce. And that imposter syndrome really took over for, for, for a little while there, you know, and then... Uh, I was fortunate enough to get into code up and move on from there. Okay. Uh, for me, um, I knew imposter syndrome was going to be a huge thing just in this field in general. Um, I also knew that I, I just know that I'm a fast learner, right? Like I, I talked about that towards the beginning. I just, I know that I'm good at absorbing new information. Uh, and I figured with enough applications, uh, anybody could get on there. <laughs> so um, you know, and that's a lot of my confidence comes from my ability to just like pick things up once I'm on the job. And, um, yeah, I mean, I did, uh, like the stacks I did were Python, Mern, and Java, but then when I got hired, it was for software engineering and they immediately threw me into TypeScript. So it wasn't even like a language that I was familiar with. I just had to learn it up. Okay. I feel like I have a good a good understanding of this program. Um, I'm trying to think if I have any other questions. I don't think I do. I feel like, I mean, it's just interesting that they're teaching three stacks initially. You don't really hear about that. Um, I get this. So he, here's my recommendation. And correct me once I'm done with it if you disagree with anything. Essentially, they're not going to hold you accountable for if you're prepared for the program. It's just what it sounds like, right? So you do your due diligence and make sure that you're prepared. And so I would even ask admissions like, hey, you know, I watch Don's podcast. Like, don't don't bullshit me. Like, what can I actually do to make sure I'm actually prepared for this? Because I guarantee you, staff from every single coding boot camp at this point, like my podcast gets shared with them by a student, at least one staff. And so really try to dig in and make sure that you're prepared. You're, you're going to be, if you're prepared and you succeed in the program, you're going to be a good positive statistic and they can sell their program to more students, right? It's a, it's a win-win for both parties. But yeah, I, I think you're going to probably have to explore programming language outside of just HTML and CSS. It almost feels like HTML and CSS was a more of a supplement whereas like maybe you will tackle it with web development modules, um, when you're going through the program, but it almost feels like they have you kind of learn a lot of those fundamentals and, but they don't really have you understand fundamental programming concepts so that you can tackle all three of these different stacks, uh, with a lot of knowledge and you're well prepared and you're not cramming till the end of the night and pulling all the nighters like Jacob. And, um, you know, like, so this can, pr this can make this entire coding dojo experience, especially with self-taught much, much more tolerable and you'll be much more successful if you just prepare. So essentially what I'm saying, don't trust them to screen you out. They're going to accept anyone. And so going into it, I would almost argue, even if you do prepare three stacks in 14 weeks, isn't a lot. Give yourself a little time. Um, it sounds like, you know, the instructor that you get is probably going to matter, but sometimes you can switch instructors depending on like which stack that you're learning. So that can be convenient. It sounds like you need to be very proactive. And if you are proactive in asking questions, reaching out, that's when you get the help that you need. I think everyone should take Jacob's stance. Like, absolutely. Like, just spam them. If they, if you're not getting your answer, quite frankly, like you're paying a lot of money, like you need to reach out and make sure you get the help that you get. Cause I can see a lot of stu students from coding dojo, they're falling back. They're not asking questions. They're not being proactive. And it, to me, that's a little bit of a weakness of coding dojo. So if you're proactive again, it's one more thing to solidify a good experience at that program. And so it also sounds like the career services can kind of be a hit or a miss. Jacob, you mentioned like, you know, you can get wildly different advice depending on who you're talking to. 
I really love the advice of networking, of reaching out. Like it's so powerful. It's so powerful. So you don't have to, you're still applying to a lot of positions, but you can really reduce that number through networking. The referrals, that's an interesting percentage. I want to ask a few other people like where they would put that percentage, but that's um, actually quick follow up, Jacob. Did you mean, so it's 4% with basically a cold application. You said 40%. Is that 40%? in addition to that 4% or you have a 40% chance of getting that job if you have a referral? I think it was the 40% to get the job. And I don't know if the number that they gave me was 40% or if it was like 60%. Like I can't remember exactly what it was. I know when I was doing uh, insurance, uh, it was also very, very high with referrals. Uh, your referrals were much more likely to stick around in the business. They were much more likely to uh, get hired. They were much more likely to all sorts of things. So um, it, yeah. It, different businesses I've worked at. Also, I did want to specify you're assigned a CSM and then you work with them. And so different CSMs will give different advice. I think you can switch CSMs if you want to, but uh, yeah, you can, you're kind of just, they're like, here's your CSM. You're assigned one. What is that? A career services manager. Gotcha. Sorry. Okay. Do you get assigned a career services? I will also say, and this is something that is not going to matter to probably anyone, but they don't have any international job support. So if I want to look for jobs in other countries, uh, they are like, we don't have any expertise on that. And they told me that from the forefront. That was nothing like, that was something I knew going into the program. But uh, yeah, I, and then I, I got done with my first job that I just worked uh, programming. And then I immediately messaged my career services. And uh, within a few days, we had an entirely updated resume, updated LinkedIn. Um, oh. Lost someone. Yep. <laughs> That's all right. Get, um, keep going. They'll probably reconnect. Yeah, you're good. And then uh, if it helps anybody kind of a day in the life, uh, we would wake up, start at, I think it's like 9 a.m. is what you start class, uh, 8, 9 a.m. And then you do morning algos for like an hour. And then you do three hours of lecture. And then you have uh, lunch and three hours, four hours of just like work by yourself time. Then another small lecture and like meet up. And then it would be the day is over. Um, and you can continue to work during the free work times and even during the uh, after the work times, the Zoom calls were just kind of like open with rooms. And so you could go into the rooms and uh, you could work with other people if you wanted or work alone and just sit in your own room. Um, and then occasionally TAs would jump from room to room to just make sure everything was. Okay. Good extra information. Appreciate that. Um, I I guess I do have one more question because I feel like I just wrapped it up. I, I pretty much summarized what I thought of it, um, but I feel like you guys did a much better job at summarizing it anyways. So, and that's an interesting point about the international support. I, my audience is actually 60% from the United States, which is, it, it shocks me. All, all the advice I give is for getting jobs in the United States. So 40% is outside. So I guarantee you some people are probably questioning that. Um, I actually looked at an international uh, coding school is one of the other ones that I looked at. I think it was based out of, uh, I want to say Poland, but I can't remember exactly what, but it was a, uh, it was another program that I had looked into. So no, okay. what I can say about Cody Dojo is that they did offer like international students to, to join their program. I know in my cohort, hmm. uh, we had, uh, we had one lady that was from the UK and so her hours and being able to try to figure everything out in order to go to lecture and and include everything she she really went above and beyond she you know she, it was late hours for her while it was day hours for us so uh, so i thought that was pretty cool about coding dojo how they allowed you know international students to join as well yeah it's just specify i was talking about the career services uh yes. i think that's awesome i didn't have any international students that i know of but uh that's i mean that's that's incredible that's great in my opinion at least mm -hmm. that is actually really cool because a lot of um it depends on the country, depends on the local area. A lot of people just don't have access to good education. And I, I get questions like, hey, you know, what coding boot camps are going to accept international students? And I, it's not really a question I commonly ask people. So, I mean, we know for Coding Dojo, that's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, you should expect, I mean, and there are like kind of international, well, coding boot camps that usually are known for accepting international students. You can look that up. Um, but I would argue some of those coding boot camps keep teaching Ruby, which I think is a huge flaw, but that, that's another conversation in itself. Um, all right. So yeah, his Wi-Fi went out. Uh, so he's going to try to come back on as soon as possible, but we'll wrap up with this question. 
if who who's going to be successful at this program and who isn't do you want to take that julian to start yeah to start uh who's going to be successful uh someone that is someone that's willing to to do the research on their own and, and really understand that it's self-paced and you have to do the work if you're coming into the program thinking oh you know i'm changing careers and i'm gonna learn how to code and i'm gonna be this next mark zuckenberg you know you're coming in with the wrong attitude you definitely have to come in humble uh, and, and ready to do the work and if that's not you if you're, if you're not ready to put in hours 10 to 12 hours of coding a day 10 to 12 hours of researching you know definitely might not want to come through this okay that actually reminds me one thing that i will add is they uh my understanding is they won't bring you into the program if you have a full-time job at the time um because they're like you just won't have enough time um however one of my buddies had three part-time jobs and <laughs> he was able to slide in uh he completed the program one of the smartest guys i know but uh um yeah, my recommendation. Uh, first off, I just recommend take the Harvard CS50 course that's free online uh, as a prep course it, for this. Just take the first like four or five like weeks. It's a part time thing, so it's they only they say you should only be spending ten hours a week, so you can bust it out in uh, the first four weeks in uh, one week if you do a forty hour week, right? So uh, don't have a job while you're doing it. Be self motivated. Uh, demand uh, help when you need it. Like be willing to speak up and and outgoing with it. Um, I, my cohorts were always very talkative and very loud, but I heard that that was not the case with most. Uh, a contributor of that might have been that I'm just a very loud, talkative person, which <laughs> tends to encourage other people to be loud, talkative people, right? So, like, I'm not going to act like that's not the case, right? But uh, but um, there's definitely uh, a lot more interaction there. Um, I would also scout out which stacks you're going for. Um, in I'm in the Portland area, uh, and so they were doing... Um, Java, Mern, and Python. Python, everybody's going to get. But then instead of Java, uh, my friends who were up in Seattle did C Sharp, um, which can be, you know, quite a big difference coming out of it into the into the job uh, job market. Uh, work with career services while you're still doing it. Make sure you don't have a job. I would say uh, make sure you can just like set everything aside and just work the ten to you know eight, ten, twelve hours a day that they're sometimes going to push for. They actually give you a calendar at the very beginning, and they're like, so. This is what your daily schedule is going to look like. This is how many hours are going to work. This is what your stress level should be at throughout the program um, for each like stack. Um, they tell you don't take weekends off, but I found that if you do all the work in one day, no, it's like <laughs> you can uh, you can have a lot of time to free uh, free time. But um, yeah, I'm trying to remember. I know that there were a couple other things that uh, I was thinking of adding there while we were talking, but uh, I think that's everything for me. Just be really, really. Um, focused uh the one of the other things i saw mentioned was the portfolio building was based off projects uh the projects at the end are all optional but they're they're option they're semi-optional like they're not going to drop you from the program if you don't do them but they're extremely strongly encouraged so the programs we actually spend only three weeks now working on the stack and then we spend the last week working on the project um you're encouraged to work uh as part of a team but again it's not required uh and then we all show off our projects at the end um by the time you get through the program, you look back at your old projects and you're like, hey, that looks like trash, <laughs> right? Especially if you end on MERN, uh, because then you learn React and all your programs front end uh, don't, or your projects front ends uh, don't look very well. It is web development focused, not software engineering focused, which isn't going to be a major thing. They advertise that from the beginning, but these are just like notes to know. Um, that said, I went into software engineering and I didn't have a problem transferring the skills. Um, what else? Uh, oh, I didn't do my final project and didn't put my projects on my resume. So uh, they are semi required and I would highly recommend doing them, but know that if you don't like them by the end, <laughs> like there are, you can still create more projects and you should be uh, keeping up on what you're doing. They also offer uh, like Azure workshops that you can go to. They hold those every couple months. Um, and you have to be able to use Discord because all of their, the majority of their communication happens on Discord. Um, there's also, if you take full advantage of their Discord, their Discord channel also has a lot of ability to interact with other alumni uh, and talk to them. Um, 
And that can help if you're working on projects or if you're just looking for advice on getting jobs and stuff. Uh, a lot of people still go into the Discord channel to give tips and advice. Um, if I'm leaving anything out, please help. <laughs> so, All right. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that was about everything. Um, you sure? Well, actually, no, it's, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I, uh, I'm sure that I can find more, but um, I'm just trying to be thorough. No, I think you did a good job with that. I appreciate that extra information. Um, just a question. So when you, um, I guess just clarification, um, how do you define a software engineer? Because usually those terms are interchangeable, but how do you define it? So that's the thing. I'm newer to that. Like, I'm not going to act like I'm an expert. I, uh, mm -hmm. I'm not, <laughs> I'm newer to the, the space, if you will, to the, to the career field. Um, I just didn't work on much web-based applications. So my applications when I was like I was hired as, as a software engineer, I occasionally did something that was React, but most of it was like interacting with databases uh, and it was implementing, uh, like for instance, one thing that I did was I uh, used the, I'm trying to say stuff without giving any details. I, I took stuff from a database and I used it to update all of the profiles for the company, right? Like the company's uh, Google profiles. Um, those are the kind of programs that I would write and that I would work with. Um, and I would deploy as different functions at, on different cloud networks, right? Um, instead of like when I'm in the bootcamp, everything is a website. I'm making a React website or I'm making a Java Spring Boot website or I'm making a um, Python with HTML and CSS website, uh, which is fine. That's what the class is for. But, <laughs> but uh, I, the difference being how much of what percentage of my job is based on um, web applications versus what is based off software. And that was just what I happened to get hired for. Um, I kind of prefer software engineering, but if anybody's looking for a job uh, or like anybody's looking for a, a junior developer for dev or engineering, feel free to hit me up. Um, so just to clarify in the curriculum though, you're still working with backend languages, building APIs, yes. interacting yeah, yeah. with the database. Yep. Yeah. Okay. No, we, we do both sides. Um, I was gotcha. just to talk about the difference, I guess, with, with my personal experience just in the job field was I just didn't do as much front facing stuff. And that was because somebody else on the team handled it. So, uh, okay. and I just didn't work on those projects very much. Um, I will say that if you're gonna do it self-paced and not listen to the, I love the dog. If you're not gonna do the, um, as much interaction with the teacher in the lectures, uh, sometimes their uh, digital programs like they can be very thorough because they have an online platform. Their online platform can be really thorough and it's going to recover a lot of the stuff that's on the lecture. Like the lecture stuff will parallel the stuff that's on the platform, but there will occasionally just be wrong information on the platform or gaps, um, especially in their older classes. Uh, as I was mentioning earlier, I took the Java and they had not updated it in a while. Um, also, I was going to say this because we talked about admissions and asking them specific questions. I don't know if admissions has any experience with programming. Um, I kind of got the vibe that they didn't. They are just there for recruitment. Um, my recruiter admissions guy also said that I only needed a few bytes of RAM going into the program. And when I got to Java and Spring Boot, my computer just straight up wouldn't run. Uh, if I tried to open uh, Spring Boot on my uh, few gigabyte of RAM computer, so I had to get a whole new computer, um, which was not planned for, like, <laughs> but uh, worked out fine. Um, and the teachers are like, yeah, admissions can be, uh, or the recruiters can be interesting sometimes, was one of the quotes that I got from the uh, the TAs and teachers there. So, Okay. Yeah. I was going to wrap up with. Um, and Jacob, also, all of you um, probably all have YouTube accounts, most, most likely. So uh, feel free. I'm sure people might have a few questions in the comments. Feel free to come in, answer questions if you think of something else, something like that. Sometimes students will do that because... I, you're not going to you're not going to be able to share every single thing jacob yeah. and like um and i know there's going to be follow-up questions and you'll be like oh my god i cannot believe i forgot that and then start typing it out so yeah phil i'm essentially inviting you to do that in the comment section all right, uh, all right. um you link to this when you're yes okay perfect uh all right adrian can you hear me yeah sorry about that uh i'm on you're my good. phone now. <laughs> no you're completely fine um so essentially i think we're gonna wrap it up there did uh, i guess adrian did you have anything else to add um i guess the, i was going what i was going to say before you know my wi-fi got off um mm -hmm. at coding dojo like i was like really 
like I think I was too comfortable for it to be called like a boot camp. So like I think it was too easy to graduate, even though like yes, I was stressed during it. But um if I were to tell anyone that goes to coding dojo, I say, I'd say don't worry so much about the bell exams. The bell exams, they're not too hard, but just focus on getting the recs and really focus on your project for project week. Try to try to network with your like other cohort mates and do a group project or just focus on it completely. Like utilize your full time. I like it. It's good advice. Yeah, because like I mean, like for me at least, like I, I was stuck with work, and so I can't really do that anymore. Like have a full week just dedicated to a project. So mm. you have you're gonna have three of those. I'd say use all three of them wisely. That's good advice. Yeah, you definitely had a concern with where you ended up with your portfolio. So, I mean, I think being extra proactive with this coding bootcamp is going to go a long way for each each person. Um, cool. Anything else to add, Julian? And then we'll go ahead and do our outros. No, nothing else for me. Uh, okay. Yeah, I'm good. All right, cool. Well, I'm good. I've uh, elaborated on quite a bit. So that's it. Um, very curious what you guys think of it. it it's... I, I did the Coding Dojo review a long time ago, so I don't even know if it's different at this point. I probably got to check it out at some point. But um, I do feel like this review was slightly different. And also, uh, Jacob, as you pointed out, we had one student that wasn't even from Coding Dojo. So my, my little blooper podcast episode that I decided to put up. But yeah, let us know what you think in the comments. Let's go ahead and do our outros. Um, Jacob, if people want to reach out to you and anything else you want to shout out, where could they reach you? So I'm at LinkedIn. Uh, if you do like the slash and then just do Jacob dash Roachford, just as you see it spelled here on Zoom, uh, that takes you right to me. So you can reach out to me there. All right, cool. How about you, Julian? Uh, also on LinkedIn, uh, Julian Martinez, full stack uh, developer. Uh, definitely reach out to me as well. Uh, have a project uh, out there too. Uh, it was a capstone project with CodeUp. It's uh, swapabook.xyz. Uh, feel free to check it out okay how about you adrian uh yeah you can find my linkedin and my github on aa11.dev that's where my portfolio site will be but i just put like a placeholder in. so you'll find my linkedin and github right there okay all sounds good well if you have any follow-up questions feel free to leave it in the comments or even reach out to them directly uh like i said stick around for a couple minutes but jacob julian adrian thanks so much for coming on